But have they ever examined the grounds of their secession? Have they ever compared them with the law and the testimony, or with the acts and constitutions of this church agreeable thereto? Nay, they have never once pretended so much as to examine them by the rule, but they have condemned them summarily for their secession and for their declinature in bulk. If this is agreeable to Protestant principles, let the world judge. Can they give an instance of it in any well-constituted ecclesiastical court where their power and authority has been declined and grounds and reasons offered for the same, and yet that court have not particularly examined the grounds and reasons for such declinature and offered their reasons from the word of God for taking off the force of the same? So did the Synod of Dort in the case of the Remonstrance, and so will every synod do who binds not up the consciences of church members to give implicit faith to their decisions. I am informed that at the late pretended assembly, some of the members pled that the grounds of the seceding minister's declinature or secession might be inquired into and examined, and that this was absolutely refused. Whether this was so or not, I am sure that a demand of this kind was both just and reasonable, but if the assembly had impartially examined the facts and deeds objected unto them by the associate presbytery in their act in declinature, the deeds of the present judicatories could not have borne the light. They could not have borne the trial of the Lord's word, nor the acts and constitutions of this church agreeable thereto. When the seceding ministers published their testimonies, both first and second, the judicatories might have pled for themselves that they were not concerned with such papers which were never laid before them in judgment, but now they are without excuse. They have had a short summary of the grounds of our secession read in open court before the late pretended assembly and put into the hands of their moderator. But as they have never once examined the same, nor offered the least answer unto the facts objected unto them, nor anything from the word of God or constitutions of this church to take off the force and weight of the reasonings contained in the Presbytery's act and declinature, therefore I may justly conclude that all the thinking part of mankind that are not under the same willful prejudice and bias with Mr. Curry and his pretended assemblies and commissions will acknowledge that I have just reason to say that the late pretended assembly have deposed the seceding ministers by their mere arbitrary will and pleasure, or they have deposed them because they would have them deposed. Secondly, the above-mentioned act and deed against the seceding ministers is laid in ambiguous terms. In regard, they prohibit and discharge the said ministers and every one of them to exercise the office of the ministry or any part thereof within his church in all time coming. Though they pretend to depose them in the name of the Lord Jesus, yet they do not absolutely prohibit them the exercise of the ministerial office, but they do prohibit and discharge them to exercise the same only within this church. By the words of the assembly within this church may either be meant within the bounds of this national church that is within Scotland and in this sense of their words the seceding ministers may warrantably and lawfully exercise their ministry anywhere else though this assembly pretend to depose them from their office in the name of the Lord or by the term within this church may be meant within that which is called the established church that is they are discharged the exercise of their ministry as ministers of the established church of Scotland and if this is the meaning of the assembly's words then the seceding ministers have never since their secession disputed this point with the judicatories. They have never reckoned themselves ministers of what, of what is called the established church. Since the time that they declare their secession from ecclesiastical communion with the present judicatories, yea, they may justly reckon upon all the grounds and reasons I have given in this section that, under the shadow of that which is called the legal or civil establishment, the present judicatories are departing from and treading down our reformed and covenanted principles, whereby the legal establishment is become a snare unto them, and though good in itself to a church when rightly used, yet it is abused by the present judicatories not only to the hurt and prejudice, but if the Lord in his sovereign mercy do not prevent to the subversion and total ruin of the once famous reforming and covenanting church of Scotland. Thirdly, I observe that though the pretended sentence of deposition is passed in the above arbitrary manner and laid in the above ambiguous terms, yet they pretend to do it, quote, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the sole king and head of the church, and by virtue of the power and authority committed by him to them, unquote. Which, for the reasons I have given above against the said act, 
appears to me to be a public profanation of the great and holy name of our exalted Redeemer, who is given to be head over all things to his church, which is his body, and unto whom his Father has given a name above every name, that, is, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. The seceding ministers are warned to lay their account with such treatment, and they may comfort and encourage themselves under it from the words of the Lord. John 16, verse 2. Luke 6, verse 22. Isaiah 66, verse 5. It is not the first time that ecclesiastical judicatories have profaned and blasphemed that adorable name by their tyrannical acts and sentences. The anti-Christian church, that woman who is full of names of blasphemy, uh, Revelation 17, verse 3, does emit her acts and constitutions by the Pope, who pretends to be Christ's vicar on earth, in the name of the Lord Jesus, the sole king and head of his church. Therefore, the seceding ministers have not ground to be dismayed or discouraged when corrupt ecclesiastical courts separate them from their company and reproach them and cast out their names as evil for the Son of Man's sake. And, when all this is pretended to be done in the name of the Lord, tis no new thing, your brethren that hated you, and cast you out for my name's sake, said, Let the Lord be glorified. I shall only further observe that the above deed of the late pretended assembly is, on the part of the pretended judicatories, a doing what in them lies, in their ecclesiastical capacity, to bury a testimony for Christ in Scotland. Their present testimony, on the part of the seceding ministers and their adherents, is their public confession of the truth held forth from the word of God in our confession of faith in opposition unto these dangerous errors that have sprung up in this perilous day wherein we live. It is their confession of the order, government, and discipline of our Lord's house, of the rights of his spiritual, free, and independent kingdom, as also as the liberties of his subjects in opposition unto the violence and injuries, the dishonors and indignities that have been done to the same, both in former and present times. What have the judicatories done? They pretend to depose the seceding ministers. I do not compare myself with any of them. Nay, I do not think myself worthy to be named amongst the witnesses for Christ. But the deed of the late, presbyter of the late pretended assembly excuse me, is in itself an ecclesiastical killing and slaying of the witnesses and a burying their testimony. I pray the judicatories may see the evil of it, that this iniquity and wickedness may not be laid to their charge. The last instance I give of tyranny in the administration is the conduct of the late pretended assembly upon passing their extraordinary sentence against the seceding ministers. As I observed above, they appointed their moderator to write letters with copies of their sentence to the magistrates of the several burgs connected. This was done with an evident design to stir up the magistrates against the ministers. It was also executed without delay. The sentence is passed upon Thursday, the 15th of May, and before or upon the ensuing Lord's Day, the moderator's letters came to the magistrates of the respective burgs. The magistrates of Stirling, in obedience to the assembly sentence, discharged the church bells to be rung for convening the people to worship. They likewise commanded the church and churchyard doors to be locked against their faithful minister, the Reverend Mr. Ebenezer Erskine, whom they had unanimously called to labor in the work of the ministry among them, whereby they served themselves heirs to the iniquity and wickedness of some of the, their forefathers in that place, who stoned that eminent seer in his day and faithful martyr, Mr. James Guthrie. Likewise, the magistrates of Perth, having received the moderator's letter upon the Sabbath morning, sustained themselves executioners of the assembly's sentence against their minister, who, according to the measure of grace given him, had labored nearly twenty-four years in the work of the ministry amongst them, and who was also unanimously called to that work by the people of that congregation. The said magistrates themselves came to guard the church doors, and when they saw their minister coming, shut the doors upon him. Whereby one Mr. John Haley, then a probationer, employed by Mr. David Black to preach that day, being attended by the said Mr. Black, was with the assistance of the magistrates thrust into his pulpit. I pray the Lord may give them repentance for and forgiveness of their iniquity, that it may not be lay, laid to their charge, nor to the charge of that place. As for the rest of the seceding ministers, they do as yet possess their churches, except the Reverend Mr. Nairn, minister at Abbotshaw, the heritors of that parish, having at their own hands, sometime in the month of October last, locked the church and churchyard doors and nailed iron plates on the keyholes of the said doors. The conduct of the judicatories in stirring up the civil powers against the seceding ministers is not unlike the tyranny of the Church of Rome, who first condemned the Protestants as heretics, 
and then deliver them up to the secular powers to be prosecuted and punished as if they were the grossest criminals and malefactors. Upon the whole, it is matter of mourning and lamentation that, in the once reforming and covenanting Church of Scotland, judicatories that call themselves Presbyterian should after this manner prosecute and persecute ministers who are endeavoring to bear testimony to our reformed and covenanted principles. Ah, that it should be told in Gath and published in the streets of Ashkelon, the laughter and joy of these that are open and declared enemies of our Reformation rights and principles. However, all the well-wishers and true friends of Zion may encourage themselves in this, that the Lord will yet arise and have mercy upon Zion, and that when he builds up Zion, he will appear in glory. From the several instances I have given of the tyranny of the present judicatories and the administration, it is evident to me that this national church as she is represented in her present judicatories has not a claim to the above-mentioned character of a true church, given in the, art, the 18th article of our first confession of faith and in other confessions of the Reformed churches, and that, though her outward form is Presbyterian, yet she is not a whit better than if her form and model were prelatical. In regard, she exercised a lordly and magisterial power over the heritage of God in the several instances which I have given. Her present judicatories rule the flock of Christ with rigor. They are guilty of such violence and oppression upon the heritage of God as Mr. Curry in his just venom calls impious robbery, sacrilege, and raping. They are, in the instances above given, perverting the keys of government and discipline and are so far from exercising them for the edification of the body of Christ that they are exercised for their destruction. They are not gathering but scattering the sheep of Christ and if the several instances above mentioned, they are walking quite contrary to the end and design of their erection and constitution in the church. This is mainly and chiefly for the honor and glory of the exalted head for the edification of the body of Christ, for the redress of their grievances, for the preservation of the institutions of Christ and their purity, for maintaining that liberty wherewith Christ hath made his people free, and for purging the church of such errors or erroneous persons, whereby the whole body is in danger to be leavened. But instead of answering these valuable ends, the present judicatories have let the erroneous go without censure, or with no censure proportion to the scandal they have given. They have cast out of their communion. They have suspended and deposed ministers against whom they have not, nor cannot bring the charge of error in doctrine or immor immorality in practice. They have spoiled the flock of Christ, of that liberty wherewith Christ the head hath made them free. They neglect and despise the petitions and representations of church members for the redress of grievances, and they show no evidences to this day of repentance for their tyranny in the above and like instances, nor of a disposition to reform their violence, Excuse me. by all which they have so far forfeited their claim to the exercise of the keys that the same devote, uh, devolves upon the smaller part who, who desire to cleave to our reformed Presbyterian and covenanted principles. From the observes that I have made above, upon the instance of tyrannical, excuse me, upon the instances of tyranny mentioned in the defense, the reader may see that Mr. Curry has never entered into the argument that I'm that, and that my argument, as it is stated upon the head of tyranny, stands good, notwithstanding of what is advanced by Mr. Curry. And when the above instances of tyrannical proceedings of the two late pretended general assemblies are subjointed, the argument comes out with new force and evidence. If a judicial killing and slaying witnesses for the truth can be sustained as instances of ecclesiastical tyranny, and when all the instances of tyranny are put together, and especially when it is considered that the judicatories continue impenitent and obstinate in their sin, every unprejudiced person may see that the present judicatories are not only guilty of some acts of tyranny, but of habitual tyranny in the administration. Section 3 whether or not intruders, or such as are imposed upon dissenting and reclaiming congregations, ought to be received by the church as lawful and sent ministers of Christ. One of the characters of, the, of a true church given us in the 18th article of our first confession of faith is the right administration of the sacraments of Jesus Christ, which must be annexed to the word and promise of God to seal and confirm the same in our hearts. Upon this, Mr. Curry tells us in his essay on page 3, quote, None can object against this that the seals of God's covenant are as purely administered in this church as they were in any, unquote. Yet I have objected against this, and I have affirmed that Mr. Curry might have spared, or at least ought to have qualified, his above-confident boast. Section 